The studio room is finally finished, or at least it will be by the end of this video. So it is time for the reveal, but let me show you one little thing before we do all of that. So this studio project has obviously been uh, kind of ticking over for quite a while. We started off with a whole load of like builder problems and getting the place constructed in the first place was a bit of a challenge. So I ended up having to finish most of the build off myself and that obviously slowed things down a lot. And then this space became a temporary workshop while we were doing the main renovation of the house. And now that the main renovation is pretty much finished and don't worry, the main reveals of all of that will be coming very, very soon. But over the last couple of weeks, we've really been concentrating on getting the studio room finished so that we can actually use it for its intended purpose, which is basically a uh, a video recording suite. It's also going to be used for editing and recording the drums for one of my other channels as well. So the key thing about this space is that it's as soundproof as we can make it within the limitations of permitted development. And one of the things that I've not got on to show you yet is the door and what we've had to do to kind of cater for soundproofing in, in the door area because this is a, a double door. I'll just shut this one. Uh, so we've basically got this door here and then we've got this secondary door here with a decent air gap between them. I'm going to be covering this side of the internal door with tech sound membrane which is like a high density uh, soundproofing material. We've used it on other projects before. But I wanted to show you a little bit about the construction of this because it's quite unique to a kind of a soundproof structure and, and there's quite a few things about the construction of the door frame that are a little bit non-traditional. If you're used to how normal door liners are made and things like that, this is quite different from that. i just pin that open. But one of the final things that we need to do here is to just put a little threshold across this gap. This is the expansion gap for the laminate and we just need a threshold over that. But anyway, if you remember, we originally started life with just the external door attached into the outer leaf of blockwork, and that's pretty kind of standard. You've got the sill down the bottom there and the actual door liner going up the sides. But then for the internal door, one of the things that you have to cater for is obviously bridging this gap here, bridging this gap here, but at the same time making sure that your inner framework isn't touching the outer framework because you want to avoid any form of sound transmission from the inside building. Effectively, this is like a room within a room and it's really important that we don't bridge that gap. So what we've got here, here is the original door frame. We've then got the door jam or, or the door stop here. Again, I've made my own for this because it all had to be custom sizes. And then we've got this section here which bridges across the cavity. I've used MDF for this, but at this edge, you can't really see it, but at this edge, this doesn't touch the outer door frame. There's about a five millimeter gap down that edge. You can't even see it. It's filled with acoustic sealant and then painted over. So there's really no way of knowing that it's even there. But what that does is that it stops sound transmission from the inner building to the outer building or to the outer door frame. And that's true all the way around, all the way up the door, right the way up there and along the top as well. So again, this is just MDF, but five millimeter gap on this edge here, and that's filled with acoustic uh, mastic. But then at the bottom, we've got this transition, kind of, a, I suppose you could view it as a step, but it's a transition between your inner door frame and your outer door frame. And obviously we've got the jam here. We would have a, a jam there and a jam there, or, or at least a weather strip of some description to stop rain kind of blowing in. And it all needs seals around it anyway. So every single part of this door frame needs acoustic seals. So you can't leave it where there's an air gap going all the way from the inside to the outside. Sound would just flood out of that. So you have to have a jam of some description. And what I could have done is just had a, a normal kind of door stop at the bottom here and over on the front side as well, on the outside, and it would leave this gap in the middle. It made sense just to have a wide stop. And again, because there's going to be acoustic seals on this anyway, there's no danger of sound transmitting from the inside to the outside. And what I've also done You'll see it's, you can just about see the fixings 
the fixings are only in to the inner leaf. On the outer leaf, there's acoustic sealant underneath here. So technically, the outer portion of this isn't even touching the outer frame of the building. But at the moment, the next thing that we need to get on with, as I say, is trimming this door so that we can bridge over this little gap here and then that finishes the door off. We can get all the final painting done and then once all the final painting's done we can get the door seals on and that's literally the last job. So uh, I'll get all that done and then I'll show you what the room's like. Here is the trim I'm going to be using. It's a solid oak trim and that should fill the gap perfectly. I don't want it too huge so that should do the job. So all I'm going to do at the minute, I'm just going to hold it against the bottom of the door on the left and I want about a three millimetre gap under the door. So there's there's a th kind of threshold trim, there's three millimetres. So I'm just going to mark that on the bottom of the door. And I'll do the same on the right hand side. It should be the same amount that I'm taking off but uh, just to be on the safe side. So that's the threshold on the floor. Three millimetre gap. I'll just put a mark there. So it's about five mil that I need to take off the door. Obviously we might have a doormat here or something, so I don't want to risk leaving the door too long, but obviously at the moment it's very, very close to the floor. So uh, we we'll need to trim off about five millimetres. I'm just going to do that with the track saw. Chickens discovered the apple tree, by the way. Lordy, don't get the bird. I'm not being funny, chicken, but you don't stand a chance. So in terms of attaching the uh, threshold strip trim, that's just going to sit there like that. And all I'm going to do is pop a few little blobs of silicon down here. Not too much, don't fill the whole gap with silicon because you do want to allow this wood to expand and contract. But if you just do a couple of little blobs, it'll be enough to hold it in place. So I'll just very gently place that on top, make sure it's got a nice kind of bond into the silicon, but no more than that. That'll be lovely. That ain't going to budge. But once everything's dried, I'm going to oil this strip up and then I'll put a bead of silicon along the front here and it'll just stop any moisture and water getting underneath this strip and it'll properly securely hold it in place. But for the minute, that'll do absolutely fine. And then the really sneaky bit, because we've now got a bit of a mismatch of levels between this and the threshold, we don't want too big a gap at the bottom of the door. So the piece of wood that I trimmed off the door, that's going to go at the bottom here to fill that gap. And then once it's all corked in and painted, you'll not even know. I'll have considerably less problems with mud once we've actually got a path going down the garden. That's a job for next year. But for this year, I guess you want to see this room finished. So folks, welcome to the studio. So 
we're kind of in uh, daytime mode at the minute with the curtains open and uh, that works really well for natural light and things. I'll talk about that later on. This pallet wood wall, a little bit of history behind it, it all means something. Every little bit of pallet wood on this is leftover pallets from the main build on the house. There was so many pallets, I didn't want to just chuck them in the bin. Every single one of these had to be cut to the right width and sanded down and stained but it's really good for acoustics and it's really, it just looks pretty cool, I think. Quickly put it into nighttime mode. To be fair, it's not really nighttime mode. It's also like when you just want a little bit of extra soundproofing, then uh, these heavy curtains can help a bit. Gives the room just a bit of a different vibe. It's a, a much warmer vibe with the curtains shut, but obviously then you don't benefit from the natural light from the window. But there are situations when you're filming, you know, you might have like really bright glaring daylight coming through and you need to control that a little bit because that can really cause havoc when you're trying to film something. So having the curtains there uh, performs a number of functions, acoustics, a little bit on the sound isolation side and control of lighting as well. And it just makes it a nice kind of chilled vibe in here. We'll open them up again, make the most of the views. So this is your first sneak peek of the set really, because this will be the place where I'll be recording almost all of the videos for the Small Business Toolbox channel, which if you're not aware, that's another channel I've got. Hit subscribe, I haven't put anything new on there for ages because I've been waiting to get this room finished. But yeah, that channel will be ramping up again. If you're interested and you're wondering what all this stuff is, by the way, a lot of this is, uh, well, that was my first ever SLR. That was my dad's camera. That was my dad's camera. That was my dad's camera. That original uh, JVC video camera, same one that's in Back to the Future, my parents were paying for that for about five years, I remember. They got it on the tick for a family holiday. It was absolutely state of the art at the time and probably my first experience of making like little short movies and films and stuff like that was on that camera. Uh, that's a Diana Plus camera, not an original one, but uh, yeah, you can have all sorts of fun with those. Original flip cameras, the Cisco flips, I used to use those for multicam shots when filming the drums. Again, totally obsolete now and original cine camera up there as well. Used to film delightful footage of me playing football when I was about two or three years old and really my football skills haven't increased that much beyond that point anyway. So later on I'll get behind the drum kit and I'll show you exactly how soundproof this room is. It's not going to be 100% soundproof. There's no such thing as 100% soundproof unless you live in a vacuum. But in the interests of practicality and trying to build it within the rules of permitted development, I think we've done pretty well. In the meantime, you guys have asked some amazing questions over the course of this build. So I'm going to answer a lot of those now. A couple of people had asked about dot and dab plasterwork on the walls. And generally speaking, yeah, in commercial recording studios, uh, you want to avoid dot and dab. If it was a partly wall, you would probably be trying to do something about the dot and dab to avoid like resonances building up and stuff like that. It's one of those things where you hear someone mention a throwaway comment about dot and dab being really bad for soundproofing and that it can generate like extra noise. And no, dot and dab doesn't generate any extra free sound energy but you can end up with problems with resonances. That is a really big complicated topic in its own right. And generally speaking, anything that you can do to avoid resonances is a good thing. And that's why in a professional studio, you just don't even bother. You don't take the risk of using dot and dab because if you're spending a million pound on a recording studio and there's alternate technologies out there that could uh, just resolve that issue, then why bother? But in a situation like this, which is like effectively a 20 grand box in a garden, it's really not a problem. And apart from anything else, the only wall, the only big wall with dot and dab on is this wall here. And the wall opposite it is full of wood. So we're not really getting like resonances building up across the room. And most of this wall is covered in stuff. So there are no bad resonances in this room. We've also deliberately designed the room size to be a, a kind of friendly room size. A again, we're, we're getting into <laughs> like the territory of um, 
sound design acoustics and stuff which is far too big a topic for this video but if it is something you want to get into in more depth I'll include a couple of links in the description down below. Safe to say the acoustics in this room are absolutely brilliant. The general rule of thumb for a very quick cheap man's approach to this is just avoid parallel reflective surfaces basically. So over on this side we've got the window, it's covered in like I've got curtains and things on the window side so that resolves uh, resonances kind of bouncing off that side of the room. On this side we've got like the drum kit, we've got stuff on the wall so we're not getting frequencies bouncing across that way and then as I say from this wall to that wall we've got wood on that wall which is all kind of random shapes and sizes and things so that really resolves the problem of sound bouncing that way and then between the floor and ceiling well remember the ceiling's at a slight angle so we don't have two parallel surfaces between the floor and the ceiling. The floor's probably at a slight angle as well, but it shouldn't be. For those of you interested in the geeky networking side of things, I will very, very briefly explain it. Uh, since this is a pretty sealed room at the other end of the garden, there is no way that you're gonna get a Wi-Fi signal from the house to here. So we'll really need a physical connection into the property. And to do that, I ran a 30 meter LC to LC fiber cable from this room all the way to where the router is in the house. And I also ran a backup CAT6 cable as well, just in case, which is kind of a good job because throughout this build, we have done everything we can to protect this fiber cable. We've had it like wrapped in bubble wrap and everything. And would you believe it, just before we're about to connect everything up, the cats got to the other end of this cable and gave a good chew on it. And I thought they'd actually destroyed the fiber cable. Full of teeth marks, honestly, I could have cried. But as it is, it's working absolutely fine. No problems whatsoever, no packet loss, no errors or anything like that. So yeah, quite pleased about that. In hindsight, I wish I'd run an armored fiber cable. It just didn't cross my mind at the time. I went onto Amazon, bought a 30 meter fiber cable. That's what's turned up and it's like a year and a half down the line that I'm actually connecting it up. So yeah, little lesson learned there. If you're gonna be running a long length of fiber by armored fiber cable, don't be a cheapskate like me. I did run a draw cable through the pipe though. So if anything does happen to this cable, then I can just pull a new cable through and that will of course be an armored cable. The LC to LC just runs into a little media converter box here. That turns it into RJ45. So that's the fiber coming into there. RJ45 out. That goes into this little wireless access point there, uh, it's a Netgear, what is it? It's a Netgear AX1800. And that does the job absolutely brilliantly. I'm comfortably getting 500 meg internet through this and uh, it'll go, I think it goes up to a gig, I can't remember, or this only goes up to a gig. Anyway, something only goes up to a gig. A gig is more than enough for the sort of stuff that I'm doing. Obviously I still need to box all of this in. That's one of the final remaining jobs that I need to do, but it's kind of hidden away in a corner. Here's a finished door frame, so we've got seals all the way around, bottom, both sides, and top, inside and out. So we've got seals there, and we've actually got double seals on the outside. Plenty room for a little mat, which is really essential since we're going from inside to outside like all the time. I'll just shut that. We've got the tech sound on the door. That is literally the tech sound there. I've just painted over it, took paint absolutely fine. And I had some leftover acoustic tiles as well, which I've shoved on there. They're probably not doing very much. And what we've also done as well is we've put an extra set of curtains, uh, acoustic curtains, well, they're kind of thermal curtains on this side of the door. And again, it's just another extra barrier just to reduce echoes a little bit and it also just takes another little bit of sound energy away before you get to the actual door itself because as I say the door and the window are the weak points in this room. A lot of you brought up the topic of ventilation and again that's a big subject. You can tell at the moment just from how hard it is to open and close the doors this room is so well sealed that you've got to there's nothing stopping this door shutting other than air pressure. Generally speaking in houses and things, there's enough gaps around doors and windows that you're gonna get enough air coming into the room that you're probably not gonna like 
suffocate. But in a room like this, it is something that you do need to like take into account. The dangerous thing, as far as I'm aware, actually isn't running out of oxygen. It's a slow, peaceful death from carbon dioxide poisoning. Now, this room is about, off the top of my head, 30 cubic meters. And if someone wants to do the calculations on how long I've got before I die in this room, then please pop it down in the comments below. Because depending on what website you visit, I've worked it out that it could be anything from six hours to several days. But what I didn't want to do was build in some sort of ventilation system that's gonna end up getting in the road of things that I've got in the room and the ventilation can quite easily be added afterwards. So in my particular scenario, it's much easier to get the room completely finished, work out where everything's going, and then wherever I've got like a little gap on the wall or like a little nook where I can potentially put a vent, then that's the place that the vent's gonna go. The other thing I could potentially do, because obviously I've got this nice big gap between this door and the outer door, is maybe put ventilation into the doors. That has a big benefit that I then don't have to core drill massive holes through the concrete walls, and it would also potentially make it a bit easier to open and close the doors. So jury's out on that. I could do some sort of baffled ventilation system whereby I have a hole in the bottom of the door and then on this side, effectively, we'll have a big kind of MDF box that comes up to a vent at the top here and that has baffles and things inside it. So hopefully sound wouldn't transmit too much from the holes here to the exit point here and then we'd have to do something similar on the outer door as well, obviously, so that air just doesn't get trapped in that little nook. Jury's out, that's kind of my thinking at the moment. But the other thing you have to bear in mind is that generally it's only me in this room and it's only for very short periods of time. This is predominantly a recording suite where I'm coming in to record things, whether it's voiceovers or pieces to camera. But the crux of it is, is that I'm very, very unlikely to be in here for any longer than an hour without at some point opening the door and letting some air in and out. If you were gonna be having multiple people working in here for long periods of time, then it would definitely be something that I would have to take a lot more seriously. But as it is, it's kind of, it's, it's on the back burner. I know it's something I need to sort out. I'm currently trying to weigh up the best way of doing it. I'm not rushing into it because it's not a massively pressing issue. What I might do in the meantime is pick up a little carbon dioxide sensor, although, you know, the ones that you pick up off Amazon for 50 quid, I wouldn't like to put my life in the hands of something like that, but it might be useful just to get a gauge if we are approaching kind of uncomfortable levels of carbon dioxide in the room. But to kind of vaguely answer the question that a lot of people have asked, um, how do you make a soundproof, completely sealed box? How do you introduce ventilation to it? And the answer is, is that you have a hole through the wall and then you have a, an MDF box on the inside and potentially on the outside with lots of baffles in and things to avoid the sound transmitting through the box and hopefully that's enough. You'll still hear something through it at the end of the day. If you cut a hole in a wall of a soundproof room, you are gonna be reducing the soundproof qualities of that room. But you know, one option might be to dig a massive trench down the bottom of the garden and have the air intake pipe 20 meters away. Any sound that came through that pipe is not going to be disturbing anyone anyway. And by the time it's gone through an array of baffles and things and gone all the way down to the bottom of the garden to the other end of the pipe, I doubt there'll be that much sound energy left in it. Let me know what you think in the comments below because it is definitely an open topic and it's a big topic and there's a lot of different ways of kind of cracking that nut and I don't want to rush into it and do something that I regret later on. In terms of what we're doing for heat at the moment, well, I'm really pleased that I didn't rush into putting like a panel heater on the wall because this little fan heater does the job absolutely brilliantly. This heats the room up from freezing cold to comfortably warm in five or 10 minutes and the room holds its heat really, really well. This has a little thermostat on it anyway. I keep it on about two and a half and it just switches itself on and off as I need it. Obviously, I don't leave it on at night. I don't leave it on when there's no one in the room because I don't particularly trust fan heaters, but as long as there's someone here, as I say, it just kind of switches itself on and off as needed. Lighting wise, this is one of my favorite purchases of the whole uh, project. We've just gone for, uh, I think they're TCP smart bulbs from Screwfix. So they're GU10s and each one of them connects to the network. I'm generally not a massive fan of like Internet of Things 
things, even though I have like hundreds of them. But these are absolutely brilliant because one of the things that you have to take into account when you're doing recording work is that sometimes you need a cool light, sometimes you need a warm light, sometimes you need coloured lights. And I can do all of that with this. So this is an absolute game changer for the sort of work that I'm doing here. And you can literally control each individual bulb if you want. I've got it set up in a group. So I've got like the front wall, back wall, or all lights. So for example, this is the back wall. If I want to change the lighting there, I can just go into this. I can set it onto a warm light if I want it, or a cool light. The camera white balance is gonna do all sorts of weird things at the moment. Uh, daylight uh, or I can have like a coloured light if I want for particular effects on videos. As I say absolute game changer because it means that I don't have to have big studio lights set up all the time. I can do a lot of the control of the lighting just from this app. So generally speaking I only need one LED studio light on top of that and the lighting that I'm getting in here is absolutely fantastic. I could talk for hours about the lighting and I could play with it for the rest of time. Of course, the main thing, again, the whole reason why the studio is designed like this is to make use of the natural light from the window. So most of the time, you know, a studio light over here or the spotlight set up onto a kind of cool-ish light and the light from the window all together give a, a lovely light for filming anyway. So there's no getting away from the fact that the window is the best light source in this room, but I'm still very excited about these things. And by the way, just for the fun of it, this is me illuminated only with window light. So I've got no other lights on in the room at the moment. I'm probably a little bit dark around this side of my face. I'll turn all of the main room lights onto daylight mode. So that's how I'm looking in daylight mode. That's how I'm looking with a kind of warm light. And this is me with a bit of a kind of cool light vibe to it. I've also got like a nighttime mode, which is very warm and a little bit dimmer. And one of my favorite options is to have a colored light behind me. And that works really well. Haven't decided on the color yet. In terms of general soundproofing performance, everything is generally working really, really well, pretty much as expected because we've put a lot of thought into this. The one problem that we've got still is sound leaking out at the bottom of this window, kind of above the windowsill on the outside. There's quite a big gaping gap and it's where the drain holes are. The, the sound's not coming through the drain holes, um, by the way, but it's an area that I can't seal up at the outside because otherwise any water that gets into the frame from the outside can't get out. One option would be to put an MDF strip on the inside here because the window sill's not gonna cut it. The window sill's not gonna come high enough to bridge that to kind of solve that problem. And you're still gonna get sound coming through the top of the window here or the top of the frame here and then just going straight out. So one option would be maybe some sort of MDF strip along the front here, paint it white, I don't think anyone would see. Another option would be to seal the gap up completely on the outside, maybe just leave a couple of little holes so that any water that does get into that, which is pretty unlikely because there's a bit of an overhang on the building, but any water that does kind of get blown against the window from the outside and goes down and water gets inside the frame, as long as there's some sort of route for that water to get out, we don't need the entire bottom edge of the frame on the outside to be open. We can seal most of it and just leave a couple of little drain holes. I think that might be a, a good option, maybe. This is my rack of denial down here. It's all pretty much obsolete technology, but it's all actually worked out quite well because I've still got loads of stuff that I've recorded years and years ago on DCC, Digital Compact Cassette, do you remember that? Anyway, so I've got a DCC, one of many DCC players there. Headphone amp, which I don't use very often. Uh, an old Technix cassette deck, because I've still got stuff that I've recorded from 20 years ago on cassette and I need some sort of way of playing it. An old Pioneer uh, DV343 DVD player. It was uh, modded for Region 1 as well. And again, I just can't face putting it in the bin and it's handy to have a CD player around. All of this is just worth nothing these days. This amp I picked up off uh, Gumtree for 10 quid. Anyway, this is quite handy to use instead of a normal studio amp because it's got a subwoofer out on it and I've managed to make use of a subwoofer that would have otherwise gone in the bin. Mix is always handy, had that for about 500 years. So much technology like this, it's just, it's not used anymore, but it's perfectly good gear. But yeah, it's all obsolete. 
So this is going to be very, very unscientific. Can you even see me? Probably not. So I'm just going to use my lapel mic as a bit of a test, which is totally not what you would use to record drums. So it's going to sound rubbish and I'm totally out of practice as well. But it's just to kind of give you an idea of levels. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this off. I'm going to attach it to the camera. I'm going to bring the levels down a little bit because at the moment it's probably going to probably going to distort a bit. I'm not sure. I can't see the levels on the camera at the moment, but I'll set it to a level so it's not distorting. I'll play a little bit in the room and then I'll play a little bit out the room and you can see what the difference is. But please do bear in mind when I mic the kit up properly, I've normally got eight microphones on the kit, not just one little lav mic. Bonus points if you guess the song by the way. So please don't judge, it's been nearly three years since I've picked up a pair of sticks, so I do need to get back into the swing of it again. I have no idea whether or not you could even hear what was going on there, but hopefully it's worked. So folks, that wraps up this little mini-series about creating a soundproof garden room. You're going to see this studio in lots of forthcoming videos for all sorts of different things. So this isn't going to be the last you see of this space by any stretch of the imagination. As per usual, thanks for all of your amazing comments and suggestions throughout the series. They have been so, so useful. Do pop any extra comments or questions down below. Obviously, do bear in mind that a lot of the problems that we did run into were because we were in lockdown at the point that we were starting to build this. There were builder shortages, there was material shortages, everything. It was just the, the world was in chaos. The world still pretty much is in chaos, by the way. But I think we'll cover more of that over on the Small Business Toolbox channel because it's getting a little bit off piste for the Gosforth Handyman channel. I hope you've enjoyed this. For now, as per usual, look after one another, be nice to each other, and we shall see you next time. Tatty bye.